So, look, thank you so much, all of you, for coming. And I want to, before, I know this is a bit tedious going through the thanks, but it is important. So I want to thank a few people by name before I start. Now, when I arrived here just over five years ago, um, I was a refugee from London Metropolitan University because it acts the history course. And I was given a very warm welcome by the history staff. So Rowan William, John Davis, Sean Lang, Richard Carr, and Carissa Campbell-Orr, who's come back today, thank you, who left us three years ago, replaced by Susan Flavin. So I've got wonderful colleagues. Thanks, too, to Mary Joannou, who's here somewhere, who, for her generous welcome as well. Um, and I want to thank our brilliant administrator, Marlene Buke, and our wonderful head of school, who you've just heard from, Alison Ainley. Thanks, too, to John Walsh and to Will Smythe for their technical help, and Miriam Berg for organising this event. Now, people are here from all parts of my life, uh, family and friends, people I was at university with, work colleagues, students, rock climbing friends, dog walking friends, people from my writing group, also some of the participants in the project that I'm talking about today. Thank you so much for being here. Now, many of you will know that I've been working on a study of the children born to black American servicemen and British women in the Second World War. Let me begin by mentioning Joyce. Her mother, Frances, a bus conductress in her early 20s, was living at home in Portsmouth during the war and had concealed her pregnancy. In January 1945, her younger sister Molly, aged 10, found her in her bedroom giving birth and rushed downstairs. Joyce, Joyce, Joyce narrates. She said, Francis has having a baby. And my nan said, don't talk silly. So she, Molly, said, well, you go up and have a look. <laughs> my nan never knew right up until the, the moment I was born. Francis wanted to give Joyce up for adoption, but Joyce's grandparents wanted to keep her. They loved children, although they already had seven. My nan always said to me, don't forget you've got an American dad. Her father was an African-American soldier. In contrast, when Carol B. was born in December 44 to a white mother and a black, a black American, her mother was disowned by her family. Her mother was 21, single, living in Birkenhead, near Liverpool. Carol B. Re Carol B. remembers. My mum's family, they just shunned her. It was horrible. I can remember walking down the street with her and she said hello to them and they just ignored her. Babs was born in October 44 in Ipswich in Suffolk. Her father worked in the US Air Force's engineer, engineer Battalion, based here in East Anglia. When Babs was born, her married mother was able to pass her off as her husband's because Bab initially had light skin, but after six months she darkened. She was sent to Dr Bernardo's home in Long Melford in Suffolk. Now, of this photograph, Bab says, the only way that I can describe the look of my face is one of surliness and mistrust and, yes... Understandably. So Joyce, Carol B and Babs are three examples of children born during the war to black servicemen and white British women. When I first heard about these mixed race children, I realised that this was a history that was very largely unknown. Accounts of the British experience of World War II are extensive, but they rarely feature these war babies. Further, the arrival of the ship, the Empire Windrush, in 1948 is generally assumed to be the starting point for the growth of the post-war black British population. However, about 2,000 mixed-race GI babies were born in Britain a few years prior to the Windrush's arrival. This may not sound a large number, but if we take into account that the pre-war black British population was an estimated 7 to 10,000, these children represented a not insignificant 20 to 28 percent increase in numbers of people of colour over a couple of years. I discovered that very little had been written about these children. I wanted to find out more, not least because being myself part of a multiracial family, possibly typical of many 21st century families, I wanted to know how these mixed race children had fared in what was then a very white Britain. The African American press called these children brown babies, a name clearly preferable to the term half-caste it was widely used at the time. Finding some of these children, now in their early 70s, and hearing their stories seemed the best way to learn more about their upbringing. Partly through the online organisation GI Trace, which helps people locate their GI fathers and relatives, I found interviewees and contacts snowboard. 
Speaking on the radio also led to further leads. I gathered together stories of over 50 of these so-called brown babies, 45 of whom were born in the war. It has been a privilege to be trusted with uh, illuminating and moving stories from which I've learned so much and which we'll hear a little bit about today. Amer As you know, America joined the Second World War in December 41. American servicemen, known as GIs, started to arrive in Britain the following year. Approximately 3 million American troops passed through Britain in the period 42 to 45. The film A Welcome to Britain was commissioned by the Ministry of Information and made for newly arriving US troops, aiming to give a sense of what British culture was like. I want to show you a very short extract about race relations. I mean, this film has also got a lot about how the Brits uh, drink tea all the time. Um, <coughs> oh, wait a moment. So when the elderly woman comments to the black GI on how odd that she both come from Birmingham, of course his Birmingham would have been in Alabama, which was the site of some of the worst racism at the time. Now, despite this officially sanctioned film showing a white woman asking a black soldier to tea, there were some British women who were advocating <coughs> precisely the opposite. In late summer 1942, Mrs May, another Mrs May, a vicar's wife in Somerset, called the woman, women of her village together and presented a six-point code on how women should relate to black Americans. This included the advice that, quote, if a local woman is in the cinema and notices a coloured soldier next to her, she moves to another seat immediately. If she is walking on the pavement and a coloured soldier is coming towards her, she crosses to the other pavement. On no account must coloured, coloured troops be invited into the homes of white women. White Americans also try to turn British civilians against interracial contact through spreading spiteful but often absurd rumours, such as that black servicemen have tails. One black sergeant, invited to eat with an English family, quote, noticed that every chair to which he was directed had a cushion on it, though none of the other folks seemed to enjoy such a luxury. Two months later, when he knew the family better, the sergeant learnt that a white American had told them that, quote, all Negroes had tails, which made it impossible for them to sit in an ordinary hardback chair without first becoming extremely uncomfortable, then excited, then dangerous. <laughs> now, this tail idea was still around after the war. Cynthia is here, uh, whose parents met in the war, remembers that my mother told me once that they went to Scotland and he got off the train and someone said, where's your tail? Like he was a monkey. The exact number of black GIs is not known. It appears that approximately 8% of all the US troops who came to Britain were black. <coughs> so the figure is in the region of 240,000, although never that number at any one time. <coughs> the vast majority of the black troops were not allowed to bear arms and were very largely placed in support units. However, the all-black 320th Barrage Balloon Battalion, which was based in South Wales, played a crucial part in the D-Day landings, the only African-American combat soldiers there on D-Day. The Barrage Balloons formed a defensive barrier on the Normandy beaches, keeping enemy bays at bay. David B, Dave B, who, who is over here, who's over here uh, who was put into a children's home in Monmouthshire, found out later, I think quite recently, 
was it? Um, that his father was in this battalion, which I think he's very proud. The Americans, white and black, were seen as hugely attractive, partly because everyone watched Hollywood films, and here were men with those voices from the movies, or pictures, as the British call them, and partly because the Americans were very generous with their money. This was a time of rationing, but the GIs regularly distributed cigarettes, chocolate, which they called candy, chewing gum and Coca-Cola, known as the four C's. Got any gum, chum? Children would cheekily demand, while the GIs would insistently reply, got a sister, mister? <laughs> now, I know you all know this quote, but it's just so great. Uh, it's not for nothing that comedian Tommy Trindler described the Americans as overpaid, overfed, oversexed, and over here. The American response to the name calling was predictable. Brits were underpaid, underfed, undersexed, and under Eisenhower. And uh, <laughs> US General Eisenhower was supreme commander of the Allied forces in Europe. There were, unfortunately, many violent incidents in Britain involving fights between white and black GIs, some resulting in deaths and most predicated on whites' resentment of interracial relationships. To address the potential conflict between their troops, the Americans introduced segregation of leisure pursuits. Although Britain was formally opposed to US military segregation and the army stayed segregated to 1948, it did not interfere with these segregation arrangements which involved passes for entry to towns near to American bases. The towns were designated whites only or blacks only for the war's duration. In many villages, pubs too were segregated along coloured lines. And dances were held for black GIs one evening, whites the next. If the attraction of the GIs to the British was unsurprising, given their relative wealth and glamour, what did surprise and worry the Home Secretary, Herbert Morrison, was that, as he put it, some British women appear to find a peculiar <coughs> fascination in associating with men of colour. Part of the fascination was surely unfamiliarity. Many Britons had never seen a black person before, other than on cinema screens. There was also the good manners, as they called it, of the black troops, which people frequently mentioned. Many may have agreed with the response of a West Country farmer when asked about the GIs. Oh, I love the Americans, but I don't like those white ones they brought with them. <laughs> For British women, the attraction may have also related to the association of black American culture with new forms of dance and cutting-edge modern music. As a black American magazine, Ebony, observed in 1946, quote, The average Negro GI has one advantage over his white army brother. He knew how to jitterbug. English girls love to dance. For British women, dancing was their main leisure pursuit through the 20s, 30s and into the 40s, along with visits to the pictures. The Jitterbug and the Lindy Hop were dances associated with swing, jazz and black American culture. They were novel and daring. The black GIs also had their own swing bands. These new forms of dance and music transformed the dance hall. As one woman remembers, quote, We English girls took to it like ducks to water. No more slow, slow, quick, quick, slow for us. This was living. Most British women met the black GIs in these dance halls, or also in pubs. These were the two key social spaces where black GIs and local women were able to socialise, generally on evenings designated black nights. Relationships inevitably developed. All American troops had to receive permission to marry from their commanding officers, who in the UK were nearly all white. Avoidance of this permission was a court-martial defence. For black GIs wanting to marry white British women, permission was invariably refused. The rationale was that 30 of the then 48 US states still had anti-miscegenation laws. Of the over 40,000 British brides who travelled to the US after the war, the husbands they were joining were very largely white. As we have seen, Joyce was kept by her grandparents, Carol B. by her single mother, and Babs, who had the most difficult time of the three, was sent to a children's home. Over half of the people I've interviewed were kept by their mother or grandmother. When Monica's mother gave birth to Monica in November 44, she was a 26-year-old single woman still living at home with her father, looking after her six brothers and sisters. They lived in St Helens near Liverpool. Her mother had died when she was 10, and as the oldest daughter, she'd had to leave school early to help look after the other children. Monica relates what's happened, what happened when her mother revealed her pregnancy. Quote, she was pressured horrendously to give me up, 
because my grandfather was Roman Catholic and a local, local Catholic priest put a lot of pressure on her too. They arranged a place for mum in a mother and baby home in Liverpool where she'd go in, have the child, it would be adopted and she'd come home and nobody would know about it, but she refused. When she came home with a mixed race baby, her father was horrified. Quote, there was a big row in the house. Grandad threatened she had to leave. Although he let her stay, Monica reflects, I think her life was virtually nearly over. She never went out for a long, long time. Grandad was difficult to live with. He never trusted mum after that, and she couldn't go very far. Kept a tight rein on her. And her brothers were particularly cruel to her after that. They controlled her. All these 45 poor babies were born illegitimate. Illegitimacy was heavily stigmatised in the 1940s, a stigma that actually continued right until the 1970s, and I think people today find hard to understand. There was also the stigma of bearing a mixed-race child. Mixed-race children were considered unfortunate and unwanted. To quote a pamphlet of 1940, 1942 that the Army Bureau of Public Affairs produced called The Coloured Problem, as the American sees it, Mixed marriages between white and coloured are not considered desirable, since the children resulting from them are neither one thing nor another, and are thus badly handicapped in the struggle for life. The brown babies were born and brought up predominantly in areas where the GIs were stationed, mainly south and southwest England, South Wales, East Anglia and Lancashire. These were very white locations, the exceptions being close to the ports of Cardiff and Liverpool, with their long-standing black and mixed-race communities. The baby's mothers were often treated badly, a number of their children mentioning the hostility their mothers faced. Monica's mother got called names in the street, quote, I remember one time there was a lady from a couple of doors away. Her and mum never got on. One day, mum and me were sat on the gate where we lived, and this lady came past and hit my mum and shouted in the street, you nigger lover. Terry remembers that some people, quote, would bang on their metal dustbins whenever my mother walked by. It would become a daily ritual for people to cross the road to avoid my mother rather than speak to her. If many people viewed a white woman giving birth to a mixed-race baby as her having made a terrible mistake, some of the mothers of these babies felt likewise. Jennifer's mother initially wanted to escape her mistake, quote, my mother apparently left me in the hospital when I was born, and my grandmother had to fetch me. She'd walked home in the snow. They reckon it was near, near enough, knee-deep, and she was in her night attire. I suppose what it was, she'd made this big mistake of getting pregnant. I suppose she wanted to leave it behind, wanted it to go away, which I can understand, because, as history has it, we all know in them days it was taboo to have a child out of wedlock, and to have a black one would be deemed worse. Jennifer was kept by her lovely grandmother. At least 18 of the mothers of these children were already married. In eight of these cases, the child was kept by the mother, and in all but one of them, the husband remained. One Oxford woman told historian Norman Longmate that during the war, she knew of a, quote, none too bright husband who took his wife's dusky baby as his when assured that, quote, it was the result of having been startled by a black soldier when out walking one night during her pregnancy. <laughs> now, this theory of imprinting was popular in the early modern period. You know, if you saw a rabbit you, uh, cross your path and you're pregnant, you, 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 you might have a, or a hair, you've got a hair lip, the child had a hair lip or whatever. But, you know, by the 19th or in the 20th century, it was generally not believed. None of the stepmother, sorry, none of the stepfathers of those I've interviewed believed the child um, was his, apart from Babs, but that was only initially. While a couple of the stepfathers were clearly very nice, a few were not. Carol T's mother was already married with a daughter. When her husband returned from the Navy and found Carol, he began divorce proceedings, but then stopped when he found out that he wouldn't get custody of their child. When her mother and stepfather argued, he would mention, that bastard of yours. I stuck out like a sore thumb. I was just a reminder, I suppose, of what, what mum had done. John's stepfather, I think John might be here, um, was positively nasty. John was born in May 45 in Weymouth, in Dorset. <coughs> His mother's husband came back the following year to find John. His mother was to suffer something similar to Monica's mother in being kept a virtual prisoner in her house. Quote, he punished my mum till the day she died. He punished her for what she did. She wasn't allowed out. She wasn't allowed to go shopping. Oh, she was allowed to go shopping from 10 to 12 on a Thursday, and that was it. 
and he punished me, hated anything black, whether they were musicians or anyone, and he was violent. John left school at 15 and started working for his stepdad on his height and weight machine on Weymouth Seafront, but soon left because it was unbearable. I think this photograph <laughs> illustrates the antagonistic relationship. Uh, apparently the stepfather was a compulsive gambler and John calls him a serial philanthropist. But she didn't leave him. Divorce was a terrible thing then. This is John, I think, looking a lot happier. Uh, the stepfather isn't there. From age five, John lived in Weymouth during the week where he went to school. And then on Friday, he would go and stay until Monday morning with his lovely grandparents escaping his abusive stepfather, quote, From when I was five until I was about 12, I was brought up with my grandmother at Fleet, behind Chesil <coughs> Beach, which was idyllic. My grandmother was a fisherman. My grandfather was a fisherman. I was out in the country, shut away, so no one would see me. They were fantastic to me. So here is Fleet. To be brought up by them was a privilege. The little church where she was church warden is Holy Trinity in Fleet, and there it is. Frances Partridge, a writer and a member of the Bloomsbury Group, wrote in her diary the 5th of June, 1950, quote, to Fleet, in honour of Moonfleet, that's a novel by Faulkner, where Burger, that was her son, which Burger has been reading, we are shown round the church by a cheerful little Negro boy in a scarlet jersey who must have dated from the American Army's local presence in 1944. John confirms that he would have been that cheerful little Negro boy. John talks about being shut away so no one would see me. A sense of being an outcast was reinforced when these children were barred from friends' homes. Jennifer recalls one particular incident. There was a girl that was friendly, very friendly, Wendy, and she told me where she lived and I went to call for her one night. And her mother opened the door. Oh, she went bananas. She went mad. I thought she was going to have the door off the hinges. It's a good job my fingers weren't in the door. She'd have broke them. If Jennifer actually got into another child's house, quote, there were probably a grandma there weighing you up, and our daughter'd come in and she'd go, you know, she shouldn't be here, she should be in a hot country. She don't belong here, you know. And I used to think, oh, hey, up here we go. When she started school, one teacher looked at her hands and made her scrub them until they bled. Her brown skin was red as dirt. Aged about eight, in a shop across the road, Two women in headscarves were talking about her when she walked in. She heard one of them say, disgusting. She remembers that some shops were reluctant to serve her, and actually other um, people I've interviewed have also said this. John did not take name-calling lying down. When I was about eight years old, it was a snowy day, and we were playing football in the playground. And I just remember I tripped him, that's my friend Pete, up, and he got up and he called me a dirty nigger. And I punched him right in the nose. And I got a vivid memory of the blood on the snow. Well, my mum was summoned to the school. We had to go before the headmaster, W.C. Bennett, his name was, prolific caner. And I remember my mum standing next to me and he said, what you have to remember, Mrs. Stokely, is you cannot educate these people. She shook and went white, and I saw tears coming down her face. <coughs> Never said anything. Don't forget you respected headmasters. And then he caned me in front of her. There were a few teachers who well-meaningly tried to combat racism, but misread the situation. Arlene relates the story of a new relief teacher for her class when she was about eight. It's interesting because these last three memories have all been when they were eight, so clearly eight is a kind of age when you, you know, really start remembering things. There was a boy called David who had the most awful stammer. He couldn't get words out at all, and he was asked to sit next to me. And he said, no, he didn't want to. And this teacher, I can still feel the embarrassment. He brought me out to the front. He sat me on a desk. He held my hands in both of his and gave them a lecture on difference and the fact that because I was a different colour, it shouldn't make any difference. And I can still smell the tweed of his jacket. And he smoked cigars. And when I get that smell, I'm right back in that classroom. And poor David sat there trying to get it out and eventually said, I, I don't know what you're talking about. I, I just don't want to sit with a girl. <laughs> Some of the children, when small, did not know that they were not white. Janet B., when she was little, quote, didn't feel different. I knew that when I was out with my mum, and she used to take me almost everywhere with her, that people looked at me, but it was usually, oh, isn't she gorgeous, look at those curls. And I think I must have felt secure, so secure in my belonging in the family 
but it just didn't occur to me. However, quote, occasionally people would either look at me for too long or whisper something to whoever, whoever they were with as I went by. Janet Spee's mother was very blonde, as were her two other children, and they told Janet that her darker skin and hair was due to her father's Celtic inheritance. This is her stepfather, who was Welsh. Until she was 12, she thought he was her actual father, and he's one of the very nice stepfathers. In the 1940s, if a mother or her family were unable to keep her child, the only option appeared to be adoption. Of these 45 wartime brown, brown, so-called brown babies, nearly half were given up for adoption to a local authority or a children's home. Of these children, of these 21, 14 were male, 7 were female. Um, I just want to show you, these are some of the children from a home in Somerset, Honeycutt, Honeycutt House, that took in babies born to black GIs. And the cover picture we had at the beginning is also of some of these children, and I've, I've interviewed a number of them. Yet in the event, very few were actually adopted by non-relatives. Some were adopted by grandparents. You know. So out of, this, out of this 21, only four, that's three girls and one boy. So one of the girls is Janet Jay, who was in Honeycutt House in Somerset and was adopted age four by a couple who lived in East London. Her adopted mother took great pride in her and Janet's appearance. Quote, ages she would take to get my hair like that like Shirley Temple, and you remember Shirley Temple is the 1930s Hollywood child actress that had ringlets. And I think what's interesting about this photograph, it looks as if Janet's adoptive mother tried to align their hairstyles that, so that there could be this visual similarity. So why were there so few adopted? All bodies involved in the adoption process appear to assume that black or mixed race children were, as they put it, too hard to place an attitude that carried on right in through the 1960s. In part, it was, it was because it was assumed that adoptive parents would want a child who could pass as a biological child. But there was also social workers' negative attitude towards transracial adoption. One example of a potential adoption being blocked on race grounds involved Rosa, who on reading her files in the 1990s, discovered that an attempt in the 1950s by two single unmarried sisters to adopt her when she was 12 from a Catholic children's home was vetoed by a social worker who condemned the sisters' motives of sickly sentimentality. Rosa was unhappy at the home and these two women had been taking her for enjoyable day outings. She never saw them again. Clearly what was labelled what was labelled, is labelled, race matching, or the same race policy um, that came into being in the 1980s, you know, that children should only be adopted by those of the same race or ethnicity, was already in operation in the 40s and 50s, although with a very different impetus. In the 1980s, blacks, British social workers and others began to insist on same race adoption because of identity problems suffered by some of the black and mixed race children adopted by white families. In the 1940s, the focus was not the child's identity, but the questionable motives of the adopter, that the desire of a white adopter to take on a black or mixed race child could only be suspect. I'm not able to compare directly the number of white children adopted as opposed to black and mixed race, but the number of adoptions overall increased greatly after the war. From 1945 to 49, there was an average of 17,000 adoptions per year in England and Wales, nearly three times the 1939 figure. And apparently babies and young children available <coughs> for adoption were in short supply in this immediate post-war period, so one does wonder why such low adoption. I don't have the space here to say much um, about the experiences of those who were put in children's homes, but I want to mention those of Billy and David M, who are here. Um, they were both put into homes run by the Waste and Stray Society. First, a lovely nursery called Clouds, and then both moved to St Luke's Boys Home in Sussex. They were the only non-white children there and were inseparable. Oh, sorry. Um, sorry, I'd cut something out. Uh, David remembers, quote, a boy coming up to me in the home and saying, Is Billy your brother? And, not wanting to deny it, I said, well, he's not my sister, is he? <laughs> but after 16 months, David was inexplicably moved to another home. He cannot believe the insensitivity of this party. Quot, uh, quote, what actually really still gets at me is that in the report, it said, 
David appears to be very fond of Billy, so the staff knew there was a great affection between us, yet they parted us. They could have sent us together. Children's homes were against children getting too attached to each other, partly because it would make their separation harder than placing them for adoption or fostering. Two or three years prior to the separating of Billy and David, John Bowlby's 1951 book, Maternal Care and Mental Health, stressed the importance of attachment for a child's development, a theory soon to become very influential. Even had St Luke's known of Bowlby's work, the fact that it was two small boys who were emotionally attached to each other, as opposed to a mother or mother substitute and child, would have contributed to the discounting of the boys' relationship. It was the maternal bond and the dangers of maternal deprivation which were Bowlby's focus. However, there was another piece of research published the same year as Bowlby's of six three-year-olds who had come to England from Terezin concentration camp in German-occupied Czechoslovakia. This study by Anna Freud and Sophie Dan found that the children who had been together without their parents, who were all killed, were devoted to each other and had close, supportive and loving relationships. Quote, companions of the same age with their real love objects. The study demonstrates the power of attachment to other children where parents or caring adults are absent. British children's voluntary homes, largely staffed by untrained, poorly paid workers, were very unlikely to have had knowledge of new psychological and psychoanalytic findings. David M. had a bad time in the homes he was subsequently sent to, subjected to sadistic corporal punishment. When David was about 40, he thought he would try and find Billy again, the one person he'd loved and who had shown him love. Billy has an unusual surname, and David found his telephone number, and their meeting was a great success, and they are still close friends. So what about finding parents? Those who were placed in children's homes knew little or nothing about their parentage, and the first parent they usually searched for was their mother. Before the rise of the internet in the 1990s, and increasing access to many different kinds of records, this search for mothers was not necessarily easy. Age 12, Billy was told by the children's home that his parents were dead. In 1959, two years later, age 14, he had to attend a nearby clinic for a TB jab and was handed his medical <coughs> record card. While waiting in the surgery, quote, I looked at this card and I saw a strange address in Devon. I memorised the, uh, the address as best I could. A few months later, at Christmas time, I sent a card to the address. I didn't know who to address the card to, so I put, to sir or madam. We were told at school that's, that's what you write when you don't know the name. Then after Christmas, I received a letter. It was from my mother. Now his mother wrote movingly and lovingly, quote, I was so thrilled to receive your Christmas card. I've often thought about you, but she hadn't been in touch because of her husband. I hope and pray that, we, uh, that you will make your way in the world all right. She signed off with my sincerest best wishes from your friend Eileen. Billy did not reply, but kept the letter, and still has it, thinking that one day he would do something about it. In his twenties, Billy's friend Tom helped him contact his mother. Tom wrote to her at her address in Devon, and they arranged a meeting in Plymouth, under Drake's statue on Plymouth home. Quote, so Tom and I went to Plymouth by train, and got onto the hoe nice and early, and every time a single woman went by, we would think, is that her? No. Is it that one? No. And then Tom said, here she comes. He was right. He recognised her and me, or vice versa. Then Tom left us. They spent the day together. Quote, we, knew, we knew we were going to be great friends, <coughs> and always have been. I call her Eileen, not mother. He saw her several times a year, up until her very recent death, age 96. It appears that most British GI babies, whether or not they were in a children's home, or living with their mother or grandmother, were told nothing about their birth fathers or were given misinformation. For example, Monica would ask her mother, where's my dad? Why haven't I got a dad? Tell me about him. And she said, oh, I can't remember. Or, of course he got a dad, but he's dead. He died in the war. For nearly every British brown baby, their American father was a total mystery, leading many of them, once they were older, on a search for him and their unknown American relatives. One difficulty was that the American military refused to help, invoking privacy law until a British organisation, War Babes, founded by a white GI baby, Shirley MacLaid, managed to get the law changed in 1990. 
With the recent and extensive use of DNA testing, finding US relatives is now proving a great deal easier, although it is rare that a father is still alive. David G was David G was unusual, and he'd always t- been told about his father by his mother. Now Dave has come to come today, but he rang me today. He's got a uh, bad colitis; he can't make it, and he's very sorry to be here. His mother quote used to show me his photographs. His photograph: "This is your dad." She loved him with a passion. In 1999, Dave's friend Chris, a Mormon, offered to help him find his father. The Mormons owned the world's largest gen- they, they own the world's largest genealogical database. Now you, you might know this, but the, the founder um, of the Mormons, the church's founder, is a, in the 19th century, was an American called Joseph Smith, and he preached the need for church members to offer baptism to all their ancestors. Hence, you had to trace all your ancestors. So this is why this incredible and free uh, base is there, the ch- um, genealogical base database. Via access to this database, quote, Chris gave me this list of possibles with the name Green, his name is Green with a G, with an E at the end, in different parts of the States. And I phoned this guy and I had in my mind that my father's name was David Otis. Mum always thought his middle name was Otis. I get this list of names and I phone a couple and I said, do you mind me asking, is your husband African American? No, he's white, and so on. Then I spoke to this guy, said, I'm calling from England, I'm trying to locate David Otis Green. My name is David Otto Green, angry voice. And he was really stroppy about it, came across really stroppy, quite a refined voice. I thought, crikey. I had a vision of a Germanic person on the other end of the phone getting quite stroppy. I said, OK, sorry I troubled you. Dave got a bit more information about where his father was likely to be living. And a few months later, he rang this number again. Quote, the guy lives in Brooklyn, New York. Phone rings. He picks it up. The news is on. Don't you know the news is on? Yeah, yeah, but I'm phoning from England. I'm looking for David Otis Green. He said, I'm David Otto Green. I said, well, I'm phoning from Yeovil in Somerset. Were you there during the war? He said, well, yeah, I was. Do you know Joan Bagwell? Yeah, I do. That's my mum. You're my dad. (laughs) Two and a half hours later, they were still chatting, and then Dave flew out to the US. So that's one brilliant success story. Elaine, who's here, found her father in 1996. Quote, Sadly, my dad died eight years after I found him, but it was an amazing gift for me that I had those precious years getting to know him and getting to know more of who I am. In finding him, I found the other half of me. Now, this is a familiar story for those who at last found their fathers. Monica eventually learnt from her mother that her father's name was Paris Mack. Quote, I used to spend hours daydreaming. I wondered where he was. I wondered if he was alive. It was always on my mind. It was a permanent sadness. In 2002, her son showed her how to use the computer. He said, "Uh, (coughs) well, give me the name of something you want information on. I said, my father's name was Paris Mack. He put it in and said, look, mum, found him. I said, oh, yeah. (laughs) He said, no, come and have a look. And I walked over and looked at the computer screen, and there was like a sort of official form. It was a Social Security Death Index. He died in 1994, eight years previously. Don't touch it, I said. I had a moment there, like the breath just left my body. And he said, I won't touch it, it won't go away. It was a a military number. I wrote it, I wrote, and just over a week, I got a reply back. Now, Monica contacted her father's sisters, who were very elderly, and they kept they kept uh, putting the phone down, they thought she was a hoax call, but eventually she was believed. And she was sent photographs of him and the family, and she said, it was like, she can't travel because she has a heart problem, she couldn't travel out there, but it was like all my birthdays and Christmases came at once when I looked at those photos. Her daughter, quote, walked in and she looked at it, at the photo of of, uh, Monica's dad, and she just burst into sobs, and I said, what? Tell me. She said, oh my God, it's you. It's you, but in a male sort of face. And I want to show you how alike they look. Isn't that brilliant? Monica feels it's transformed her life. Quote, I'm so joyful. I don't actually need anything else. That's my dad. I know who I am. It just wipes out all the pain, all the sadness and emptiness. Full circle, just peace and joy. Terry's married mother had an affair with, her, with his father in 43 to 44, but his father was moved from Leicestershire to South Wales while she was pregnant with Terry and his twin. 
He was never told much about his father, simply that he died in the war. In 2009, when he was 65, he tried to find out what had happened to him. Through a long process, he discovered that his father had been shot dead in Cardiff in April 44, and Terry had been born two months later. Quote, he was actually killed by an American shore patrol, a white shore patrol. He had stopped this jeep with six batchy eyes. It's alleged that it didn't stop, and so one of the white shore patrols shot at them, and it ricocheted, and it had gone through my father's heart. In the court-martial, despite the account from the black GIs that the white patrol wouldn't let them take Terry's father to hospital for over two hours and subjected them to terrible racial abuse such as, if I had it my way, all your niggers would be, all you niggers would be dead, the white patrol were exonerated. Terry visited his father's grave in Maddingley, the American cemetery near here, <coughs> um, nearby, where there are 4,000 GIs buried. Sorry, again, I cut that one out, sorry. And when I saw his grave, there was John. And it was wonderful, a wonderful experience. I say, yeah, Dad, at least I found you. The question, where do you come from, and the assumption that you cannot really be British or English is widely thrown at those who are black or mixed race. Journalist Afil Hirsch writes of how, quote, being asked where you're from in your own country is a daily ritual of unsettling, reserved for people who look different. A number of my interviewees have narrated stories of being asked this question or told to go back to their own country. Anne, as a child, was told, I should go back to where I belong. She replied, and where's that supposed to be? Monica was aggressively asked, and where are you from? You're not from our country. In 1995, Guardian journalist Gary Young wrote about how black Britons are still frequently interrogated with, where are you from? He answers, Hertfordshire. They ask, but before then... He replies, I was born there. They persist, well, where are your parents from? Barbados. Oh, so you're from Barbados. <coughs> no, he responds, I'm from Hertfordshire. <laughs> as recently as April 2006, James told me, quote, a couple of weeks ago, I had one person come up and say, so where are you from? And I say, oh, Long Eaton. And he looked at me and then he walked away and I thought, yes. <laughs> so hearing these stories has made me more aware of the privilege of being a white Briton never subjected to these insulting and invasive, invasive questions. These children face racism, stigma, and an uncertain identity. Some are ostracized and barred from friends' homes, as if their mere presence threatened people's sense of racial order. Everyone referred to them as a problem. Those put in children's homes were rarely adopted. Lacking a father was hugely troubling for many of them and confounded their existing sense of being marginal as mixed-race children. That many have searched for their fathers and some have found them, or at least found American relatives, is a central part of their quest for a sense of belonging. I've learned from my interviewees how powerful the need for belonging is, not just feeling part of a country and a culture, and Britain has generally not been welcoming to black and mixed-race people, but having a sense of your heritage. Finding her father's wife and hearing that her father always talked, talked of her was a turning point for Sandy, who had grown up in a children's home. Quote, I was like tumbleweed. You know, when you see them in those cowboy films and the tumbleweed's just blowing about where the wind takes it. I was like that, but I didn't know how to change it. It's about roots, and it's your roots that stabilise you. Meeting their American fathers or relatives or simply seeing photographs has given the brown babies a sense of completeness and often a racial pride that many had lacked. Historian David Olishoga refers to the Windrush myth, quote, the widespread misconception that black history began with the coming of that one ship. The children left behind by the American, African-American GIs during and after the war are part of this pre-Windrush black British history. I thank them for so generously sharing their stories in doing so, they've shone a light on an important part of recent history that has been largely invisible until now. I hope Eugene's words, and Eugene is, is another participant, his words might echo a common sentiment amongst my contributors. Quote, I now have an official history as a member of a collective and as a person of indeterminate hybrid ethnicity. It feels good. It also feels good to have, have had an opportunity to contribute my small piece in the telling of that story. I feel like I belong here in the UK just that little bit more. 
And if you want to know more about the British so-called brown babies, please read my forthcoming book. <laughs> Thank you.